Good afternoon. Uh, yep, this is a second session for the conference. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Hong Im. I'm a faculty member at the CCRC and and uh, mechanical engineering program. Uh, like most of the uh, invited speakers, I am joining virtually uh, from Korea, but uh, it's uh, getting late at night, but I'm enjoying all the talks here. Uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce all the brilliant speakers. I ha we have uh, one uh, keynote for 30 minutes and uh, four uh, invited talks, each, uh, 15 minutes each. I think we have uh, flexible time scales. This time I would like to uh, suggest the audience to raise a quick questions for each at the end of each talk. And at the end, we'll have another 30 minute, 40, 45 minutes of uh, uh, panel discussion in which all the speakers will join and the, respond to any of the general questions that are raised from the audience. All right, so let's start with the first uh, keynote uh, coming from uh, Mr. Jeremy Fetvet. He's a chief engineer at Aid Rivers and uh, he's a graduate from NC State University. He's currently in charge of uh, R&D activities at Eight Rivers, and he has led the development of the uh, famous SCO2, supercritical CO2 alum fat fat cycle. And I guess most of the CCRC people recognize the name uh, since its inception, and he's a key inventor on numerous patents and uh, he has authored also many uh, peer-reviewed papers on the, on the subject. So he's currently overseeing the process modeling and design teams for both the natural gas and coal-fired, the alum fat fat cycle systems. So the, uh, the title of his talk today is going to be uh, Development and Research Needs of the Alum Cycle. So without further ado, let's uh, let uh, Mr. Jeremy to take the floor. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone there for the invitation to speak, uh, the invitation to present our information at this conference and discuss the where the cycle sits and the development needs uh, of not just our cycle, uh, but all CO2 cycles and SCO2 cycles, both direct and indirect fired uh, going forward. Just going to start out with an overview of our actual demonstration plan. Uh, we started working about 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago. Uh, Rodney Allen and I worked on the cycle and brought it from literally a napkin, drawing on a napkin one night, uh, to where it is today. And this is an overhead view of the 50 megawatt thermal demonstration facility that has been built in LaPorte, Texas. Uh, we're definitely excited by it. It is provides both emissions-free base load uh, and peaking power, the, the more you get into SCO2 cycles, the more you begin to, to realize and learn that they are very, very flexible, more flexible than conventional air breathing cycles can be. And of course, they have the added benefit of <coughs> inherently capturing uh, the CO2 that is created in the power cycle. We do not have to worry about uh, you know, post-combustion capture or pre-combustion capture or, at, or adding any, any other equipment to it. it is, just naturally captures all the CO2. The, the cycle itself uh, is relatively simple. You know, it is, we call it a closed loop, but it's not truly a closed loop because uh, we have to let some of the CO2 out. We have to let the water out so we did not pop it like a giant balloon. Um, but because, because of the, in, inherent capabilities of the cycle, the CO2 is already at, at pipeline quality. Uh, we may have to remove a tiny bit of water or a tiny bit of oxygen on the CO2, but it's already at pressure. Uh, it's already above the pipeline pressures. It's ready for sequestration. It's ready for use. It's ready for industrial purposes. Uh, and it's, it's very flexible in that manner. Uh, Oxycombustion, very quick overview. It's a process of burning fuel with oxygen as opposed to an air. So we're, we don't have to worry about nitrogen. We don't have to worry about uh, making NOx uh, or particulates. If we start with pure methane, all we're going to get out of it is carbon dioxide and water. Those two are very easy to separate from each other. So we end up with a water source and a CO2 source coming out of the power cycle. Um, our cycle makes it more efficient by keeping a lot of the heat inside of the system. 
uh, keeping a lot of the, the getting rid of a lot of the inefficiencies, inefficiencies that are inherent in a lot of air breathing equipment, a lot of air breathing engines, and just relying on a very efficient power cycle. Uh, nice little cartoon here at the bottom, but I'm actually going to skip that one and go to the next one. Here is a very simple overview of the cycle. We'll start up at the combustor. The amount of oxygen coming in is only around just under 5% of the mass that is flowing through the turbine. Uh, this is the new oxygen being introduced into the system. Uh, amount of natural gas is about one and a quarter percent of the mass entering the, the combustor. You can see the majority of it is the hot CO2. 94% of what's entering the combustor is hot recycled CO2. That's what we mean by these are very heavily recuperated and recycled systems. Uh, one another advantage of CO2 systems like this is your waste byproduct is your working fluid. Uh, we're, so we're not having to take water from the environment for makeup. Uh, we're actually producing a lot of water from products of combustion. But it's we're kind of trying to we're trying to turn the negatives uh, into positives on the power cycle itself. Uh, obviously, we leave the combustor, we enter the turbine. Turbines where the, the magic happens, where we extract the power, uh, make electricity, and we're still coming out of the, the turbine very hot. Uh, depending upon the configuration of the cycle, this could be upwards of 700 degrees centigrade. We then enter the heat exchangers where we cool off, we go through the pumping stage, we bleed off the generated CO2. Uh, in this diagram, it is coming in in excess of they're leaving in excess of 100 bar. Uh, so it is ready for the pipeline. We've condensed and dropped out the water. Uh, again, this is just a very simple diagram. We go back through the heat exchanger and the whole process starts again. One of the advantages that our cycle has, it, it's been the Achilles heel of a lot of oxy fuel cycles in the past, is separating air requires a lot of energy. Uh, we use cryogenic air separation to get the, the oxygen purity we need. That comes with a very substantial electrical load cost, a parasitic load cost through the power cycles. Uh, also for people that have been around CO2 power cycles, you're aware that there's a, a thermodynamic difference. The specific heat of low, low pressure CO2 is different than the specific heat of high pressure CO2. There's an energy imbalance in the tube. Uh, this Im imbalance shows up in the heat exchangers. And in order to get over this balance, in order to, to correct the heat exchangers and make the cycle more efficient, uh, closed loop CO2 cycles will generally have a, a recompressor or a hot gas compressor to fix the thermodynamic balance of the heat exchangers. Uh, we realized we can scavenge heat out of the air separation unit. So the heat of compression, of compressing the air to get it into the air separator, is the correct amount and temperature we need in the power cycle to fix this imbalance in the heat exchangers. So what has historically been a negative parasitic load on the air separation unit, we turn into a positive, and we bring that into the power cycle, and we end up with a much more efficient power cycle. And we'll come back to this, this uh, figure here in a little bit. So this is the demonstration facility down in Texas. Uh, Bay Rivers, we invented the technology. Uh, we started pushing it. Uh, McDermott uh, invested in the company. Exxon invested in the company. And Oxy, uh, through Oxy, Occidental Petroleum, through Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, invested in the company called Net Power. So we spun Net Power out uh, to commercialize the natural gas. Uh, fired version of this cycle. And so this demonstration facility was built and operated down in Texas. Uh, you can see heat exchangers, turbines, combustors. Uh, large, one of the biggest things on site is actually the combustor test rig building. Uh, we decided early on the, the two new components to the power cycle were the combustor and the turbine. Uh, we wanted to be able to test the combustor without endangering the turbine. So we modified the facility 
in, starting in 2016 and culminating in 2018 to test just the combustor outside of the turbine. Uh, if you think about what a turbine does for a little bit, a turbine extracts power by lowering the pressure and lowering the temperature. Uh, so we lowered the pressure with a, a valve and we lowered the temperature with a, a quench stream. We were able to test the combustor successfully outside of the, the turbine. And when that was finished, we put the combustor inside of the turbine and we operated the power cycle. Um, one of the things we do, which is not in the previous diagrams but shown here, is the heat ex when the CO2 comes out of the, the main heat exchanger train, comes out, we separate the water, and then it would come back to the main compressors through the pumps back into the heat exchanger train. We bleed a small part of it out and we mix it with the oxygen. So we, we effectively, we make artificial air. It is about 20% by mass oxygen, uh, the balance is CO2. And we put that back in through separate channels in the heat exchangers and that works its way back up into the turbine combustor. Uh, we do this so that we do not have to have oxygen rated equipment on site. Uh, and also because we are putting the, the oxygen back through the heat exchanger train, we do not want to have to worry about the inherent dangers of high temperature, high pressure, pure oxygen. So we make artificial air and we run it back up into the heat exchangers and into the combustion and turbine. And in the, uh, in the combustor itself, one way to think about it is the artificial air is the primary air coming into the combustor and then the CO2, the balance of the CO2 coming in is more like the secondary air entering the combustor in order to get the nice combustion products. Uh, actually, let me back up for a minute. Uh, following the successful testing of the cycle and proof of the cycle, this facility is now undergoing modifications uh, for further testing, for testing of other pieces of equipment. Uh, we are working with the United States Department of Energy to test a syngas fired combustor, uh, which would be syngas derived from either coal or biomass. Uh, so we are continuing to use this facility and leverage this facility to test specific pieces of equipment uh, to continue to try to push the technology forward. Uh, here at Eight Rivers, we view this cycle as a, a stepping stone on the circular economy, uh, going from industrial processes to using all the off pro all the offtakes in the process, getting you know saleable products and electricity, and you know just kind of feeding back on itself. Obviously, we start with natural gas, which we feed into the power cycle. We have an air unit, and we try to take advantage of every every output we possibly can. Uh, obviously, we're making electricity and we're making carbon dioxide. Uh, again, we, we like to look at this as either baseload power or peaking power uh, for the electricity. The carbon dioxide is ready for sequestration. It can be used for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, it can be used for food and beverage, or it can be sent for other commercial and industrial processes. Uh, we believe that as CO2 is captured and becomes more available through technologies like ours or other carbon capture technologies, that the price of CO2 will go down. And we'll start to see other technologies where it is used more and recycled more. And rather than just being captured and sequestered, we'll start to see more of the, the, the U in CCUS. We'll start to see more utilization of it. Uh, obviously, we have an air separation unit. We can sell oxygen. Uh, we can also store oxygen. We can store oxygen in the form of liquid oxygen in tanks, and we can actually use that uh, as kind of a chemical battery. So we could lower the load on the ASU and start drawing liquid oxygen and put more power to the grid. Uh, obviously, we can sell nitrogen coming out of the ASU, and in some cases, we can even sell argon. Uh, that, have, that is very site dependent depending upon what the facility is, where the facility is, and what other industrial uh, avenues are in that area. But there's a lot coming off of the power plant rather than just electricity. There's a lot to think about. The one thing not shown on this diagram is the water. Uh, we are actually a producer of water. We can go to an air-cooled facility. 
and start actually exporting water. Uh, so in very arid areas, uh, we can take a small pit efficiency hit, to switch to air cooling. We can actually export water. You know, the biggest difference in these two pictures right here is the lack of a smokestack. Uh, that has a lot of social benefits, a lot of you know, societal benefits. You know, so it's getting away from trying to get people away from just fossil fuels or anti-fossil fuels into low carbon uh, is definitely what we're, we are trying to push. We also have uh, you know, a big advantage in terms of, of land. Uh, we use less than 13 acres uh, for the facility, whereas a conventional combined cycle gas power plant is around 20 to 25 acres, and obviously uh, not as not as pretty as ours. One of the main drivers for eight rivers in the um, invention and pushing of this technology and commercialization is we felt early on that everybody wanted clean power, everybody wanted to talk about you know, renewables and green energy and whatnot, but people did not want to pay for it. When it comes down to actually having to pay for it, it be that becomes a little more difficult. So we strove to get clean as cheap or cheaper than polluting technologies. Uh, on the left is the cost for a first of a kind, net power facility. Uh, the middle is nth of a kind, so 10, 12, 15 uh, power plants in. On the right is an H-frame combined cycle. So this is for, this levelized cost of power is for the United States. It does have the 45Q tax credit. Uh, that will be definitely help with the first of a kind. Uh, there'll still be some benefit in the tenth of a kind, but even without this tax credit, we would be competitive with a combined cycle, the, the H-frame combined cycle facilities, which means, and this is a polluting facility, uh, this would just get worse if they put on something like a, a mean scrubbing or some other type of post combustion capture. You know, so clean, if we can get clean to be the same cost or cheaper than polluting, you know, it'll have a, a much, much better implementation in the world and, and be able to be, you know, be able to be leveraged a lot easier. Uh, this is a uh, overview of a, a commercial model. Uh, we are currently looking at several different uh, commercial facilities. So on the right, you can see there's an 1150 degree C inlet and a 925 degree C inlet. And this is part of some of the, the development, development needs and discussion uh, for our power cycle. The 1154 or the 1150 is a much higher temperature plant, but that plant also involves a lot of super alloys a lot of nickel. Uh, the turbine becomes much more complex because it requires a lot of cooling passages. And the parasitic load of that turbine is a little bit higher than, uh, because of those cooling passages than the lower temperature turbine. If we lower the temperature of the turbine uh, to around 925 degrees C inlet, we can effectively remove most of the super alloys from the plant and we can get the, the capex of the plant down. Uh, and the interesting thing about these two different extremes or these two different the plants, either the 1150 or the 925, here in the United States, uh, they have about the same levelized cost of electricity. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're paying for, you get a, a much more efficient plant, but a higher capex or less efficient plant and a lower capex, it works out to be about the same cost of electricity. So in, in an area where you have very cheap natural gas, a lower temperature plant and lower capex is you know can be more economic. If you're in a play, if you're in a part of the world where you have very high uh, cost gas, uh, and for instance, if you're importing a lot of LNG, then you're going to want to have a much more efficient plant, uh, and so you're going to want to be paying for the higher capex plant, the higher 1154 degrees C plant. And again, there's a lot of other output on the plant: uh, CO2, nitrogen, argon, oxygen. 
A Rivers released a press release a few months ago now, actually. Uh, we are currently developing two uh, commercial scale facilities. They're both approximately 280 megawatt electric facilities. Uh, one is in the Southern Colorado. Uh, it is in, we are working with the Southern Ute uh, Growth Fund. It is a, a Native American uh, tribe and we're also, they have a very large uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, we are working with them and that facility would be a brownfield facility and we'll either have a, a sequestration well put on site or we'll be attaching to a CO2 pipeline for the CCUS. The other facility uh, called, or the other project called Project Broadwing, uh, is, that is in conjunction with uh, ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. It'll be on one of their industrial facilities that already has a sequestration well. Uh, so that facility would just go ahead and sequester the, the carbon dioxide in the, at that facility. Uh, in both cases, we are looking for targeting financial close by the end of next year uh, with commercial operations beginning in 2025. And these are just two of the commercial plants we have in, in planning in stages right now. And uh, there are a couple others that have been mentioned in the news recently, uh, specifically one down in New Zealand. So we are, we've moved past the demonstration phase and we are on into the actively discussing and pursuing the commercialization of the technology. We view this as a, just a platform. So this is a very similar diagram to a, a previous one. Here we've added a gasifier. So we can bring in uh, coal derived syngas or biomass uh, into this and go ahead and you know, use that as a fuel source. And it, jump ahead briefly. We looked at this earlier. Uh, for, the, for the coal biomass, same amount of oxygen, our syngas goes up by about you know, 4%. So we have now 5% of the mass coming in is coal derived or biomass derived syngas. We lower the CO2 a little bit, but we've got the same amount of CO2 and, and water entering the turbine. We've got the same amount entering the heat exchanger. We're taking the extra CO2 off of the bottom and you're cycling the bottom bit. The turbine, interestingly enough, for the different fuels, because the CO2 coming in, being recycled, is so high, the turbine doesn't see any difference between either natural gas or derived syngas as the fuel. So we're not in a situation where we have to develop multiple turbines based on the fuel type. We just have the one turbine. So it is a very flexible cycle that the balance of plant same, and we can just change out the combustors depending upon where we are in the world uh, and what the fuel type is. <coughs> the turbine itself varies from our traditional gas turbine, an air breathing turbine. I can see an air breathing turbine brings in majority of nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of fuel, our turbine is bringing in a little bit of fuel, nominally the same amount of oxygen, but the majority is CO2. This is the differences in the turbine, what the turbine is seeing. Uh, go on into heat coming off, we've got some waste heat. An air breathing turbine will go on to a combined cycle, which will add two or three or four other turbines uh, to the facility. So ours is a much simpler with one turbine as opposed to the combined cycle which has several. To get into some of our needs or development needs, I'm sure everybody's seen this picture before from Dostal from MIT. Conventional steam turbines for around 250 megawatts, helium turbine and the supercritical turbine. Down here is this tiny little turbine. Uh, when you're working on on this, everything is much smaller, everything gets more intricate. Uh, you know, we need, for the, as far as development goes, we need to understand CO2 as a heat transfer fluid. We need to understand CO2 when it comes to, to heat transfer inside the turbine, when it comes to the seals, when it comes to the bearings, uh, not just the, the seals, the shaft seals and the gas seals, but interstage sealing, you know, tip clearances and tip losses. 
we understand that for air breathing engines. We understand that for steam engines. We've got in excess of 100 years of experience on steam. We've got 80 years on gas. We've got less than a decade on CO2 turbines, and most of those have been very small turbines, turbines that you could probably take the wheels and put it in a backpack and walk away with. Uh, so it's <laughs> that there's a very large need for us uh, there. Those, however, that is kind of an intermediate uh, need. That is three or four or five years, get a lot of that research done. What, what we have now works and works well, uh, but it could be improved. We can see drastic improvements in the turbo machinery as some of this research goes forward. This is from special metals. Uh, these are two different super alloys. 617 on the left, 740 on the right. These are both high nickel alloys. Uh, you can visually see the difference between these two and how the 740 requires about half as much metal uh, in order to hold the same back, hold back the same pressure at the same temperature. Materials research, uh, driving down both the cost and driving up the strength at high temperatures would allow us to use less metal and achieve higher temperatures, uh, not only inside of the turbine, inside of the piping, inside of the heat exchangers, but materials research is going to take a decade or more. Uh, we would like to see this pushed, but is, this is a long-term benefit, uh, but it would have a, a drastic impact on the efficiency as we can push to higher temperatures, uh, and have a drastic impact on the capex as we can use less material or use less expensive materials. And I saved the best for last. Uh, this is from Southwestern <laughs> Research Institute, direct fired CO2 combustor. This is where I feel we can have the most impact. And I believe the organizers of this conference feel we can have the most impact. Uh, and some of the people who will follow me here shortly, where we can have the most impact very quickly. Uh, <laughs> we've been burning things in air for, if we go back thousands of years, we've been burning things in air. We can all go light a campfire. Uh, we transition that air breathing engines. A lot of work has been done in order to, to really push uh, air breathing engines from the, you know, from the diffusion flames to premix to dry Lenox. There's been a, a lot of technology, a lot of, a lot of research, fundamental research pushed into air breathing engines. We need that for CO2. Uh, we've proven that we can get a flame in CO2 and we have a combustor, but we're back in the beginning. We're back in the, the early stages of that. We need research on chemical kinetics. We need research on the heat transfer. We need research on CO, burning in a high CO2 environment. Uh, there are some cases where CO2 is used as a soft oxidant because it, at high temperatures it dissociates into carbon monoxide and oxygen. So it, how does the CO2 itself affect and impact the oxyfuel cycle? Um, you know, the, the differences in molecular weights and the heat transfers, the high pressure, uh, we're burning at 300 bar. How does that impact the cycle? Uh, how does it impact the cycle when the oxidant and the recycle stream are both above the auto ignition point of the fuel? You know, so this is all fundamental research that'll impact uh, our cycle and other direct fire cycles immediately. Uh, and this is where, you know, frankly, I'm very keen to see the technology go uh, and, and and want to see what we can do uh, to improve the technology for oxy fuel, for oxy combustion, obviously for our cycle and, and for the world. And, and go ahead and get this, this technologies like ours out there uh, faster uh, with better implementation so that we can actually start to, to you know, dial back the thermostat of the planet. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jeremy. Uh, yep. So we already have, I think I'd like to address quick questions before we move on. And we can all, of course, have more general questions at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three questions from the audience. The first is from Chris Wackstaff. He's asking how big of an efficiency difference would you have between water versus air cooled? Uh, it obviously depends upon where we are on the planet. Uh, Iceland will be a little different than Saudi Arabia. 
in general, it is a, a point or a point and a half of efficiency. Okay. And the second question from uh, Dioras, uh, what's the uh, dollar per kilowatt of an alum fervent plant? How does that compare to the greenfield, NGCC and carbon capture? Uh, the final, the actual value is a commercial, uh, commercially sensitive. Uh, we we compete or are cheaper than uh, greenfield CCGT with carbon. We're we're cheaper than a conventional combined cycle plant without carbon capture. So by the time you add carbon capture to a conventional combined cycle plant, we are far cheaper. Right. I think uh, the yeah. We, we can't keep going, sorry, but I think we better keep in time because there are other people who expect the next talk to come up. So uh, just one last question. How do you manage the reluctance of the industry to adopt this technology that might interrupt the production of their product in a competitive industry uh, with thin profit margins and potentially high cost of water required for this investment? I guess it's a very uh, general question. Would you like yeah, to answer the, that? Yeah. Uh, electricity producers historically are slow to adapt new technologies because everybody expects the electricity to come on when they come in and they turn their lights on. Uh, oil and gas industries and other industries are a little more, uh, have a better appetite for risk. And so we found that talking to other, talking to the end user of the electricity is actually a better choice than talking to the producers of electricity. Well, we have another panelist, uh, Professor John Gibbons, raising hands. So I'll give him a quick you know, chance to ever have, raise a quick question. Yeah, just a very quick question, Jeremy. You, you showed mm -hmm. the fuel costs as being lower for um, your cycle than a frame H gas turbine. But if I saw right, the lower heating value efficiencies were in the 50s for your cycle. Yes. So frame H, I would think, would be lower heating value, you know, 16. Uh, I would be perfectly honest. I'd have to go back and investigate that on the graph and see where it came from. Yeah, okay. Well, as I say, it seemed to be about uh, about 25% lower. And as I say, I, I, certainly for an unabated one, I, I think the efficiency for a, for a modern H would be, as I say, new anyway, 60, 60 plus. Okay. okay, I think in the interest of time, I think we better move on. Uh, uh, Mr. Jeremy, if you see the Q&A box, there's a string of questions. So I hope that you will address individual questions on, you know, mm -hmm. with, through the comments box. So thank you again. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Now we are starting the next hour. We'll spend uh, four invited talks. The first one uh, is will be given by Dr. Westein. Uh, he's, uh, he's currently, uh, the, the, he was a prior to, he was a role, he, he served as a role as a chief technologist with the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute, ASTRI. And before, and he's currently serving as that, and he's representing his work. Uh, he was before that he was a chief scientist of solar energy at uh, CSIRO. Uh, he joined that uh, in 2000, and after 19 years of uh, implementing renewable energy projects with industry, and working in many uh, power sectors, and now he's he now further looking into how to improve solar energy technology, which led to uh, many pioneering work with the uh, colleagues on uh, low cost and high performance heliostats. Uh, today, he will be talking about the developments of uh, SCO2 power cycles and their applications. So with that, uh, Dr. Stein. Um, thank you, Hong. Can you hear me okay? Yes, good. Lovely. Um, look, thank, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to, to talk. Um, I'm actually still with, with CSIRO. I thought I'd just uh, provide a couple of slides about the Commonwealth Science, Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, where the, uh, the lead research agency in, in, in Australia. We have uh, 57 locations 
and we operate over the whole spectrum of R&D, animals, astronomy, climate, environment, health, mining, manufacturing, and of course, energy as, as well. Um, you, we, we, we have been responsible for quite a number of, in, of different inventions over the years, but uh, the one that you, you may be quite familiar with is the fast Wi-Fi that um, you, you get at uh, restaurants and, um, and other locations around the world. Um, CSIRO was the inventor of that, that particular technology. Um, I, I think we've had a great introduction from Jeremy on uh, supercritical CO2. I'm going to step back a little bit and talk more, more generally about supercritical CO2. Uh, I guess the alum Fedbet cycle is a particularly advanced version of the more general supercritical CO2 turbines. Um, first of all, why, why, what, what is supercritical CO2 in the first place? At around about uh, 31 degrees Celsius and uh, 7.8 megapascals, CO2 turns into a supercritical fluid. And that has a number of, of advantages. If you think of a typical uh, Rankine cycle steam turbine, around about 42% efficiency, um, the, the rest of that, that energy loss, uh, maybe 50% of the energy that's going into that, that turbine cycle is going out as hot fluid, hot water. But um, you've got the advantage in that cycle of only a very low pumping power because you're pumping a, a, a water which is a, a, um, a, a not not, a, not a, which is an incompressible liquid. Um, in the case of the air breathing uh, turbines, uh, you still have around about the same efficiency, maybe 35, 40 percent for aero derivative, but you have a very big compressor power, which is where all the energy goes. In the case of supercritical CO2, you've got the best of both worlds. Uh, you've got low pumping power and, and very high efficiency. Um, particularly high efficiency at, at higher temperatures. And you see in the top right-hand curve, curve there that um, the crossover point between uh, a subcritical Rankine cycle and uh, an RCBC uh, uh, supercritical CO2 turbine is noted there at about 450 degrees. I actually think it's more like 550 degrees Celsius where that crossover occurs. But at higher temperatures, you get higher efficiencies from the supercritical CO2 cycles. Um, similarly, with a steam turbine, as you come down in capacity, you start to get a very big drop off in performance. Uh, but you can see in the, in the bottom right hand curve there that um, the, uh, the, the drop the drop off in efficiency and performance is a lot less than it is in a, in a Rankine cycle. So it means that we can go down to smaller capacities without any loss of performance. They're a much um, uh, less complex cycle than, than a Rankine cycle so that there's a potential for lower capital cost. And I think also because they're a relatively simple system, there's the chance of in, 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 a, in the turbine market at the moment, you've got maybe a small handful of, of, of OEMs in the, in the large gas turbines and large steam turbines. But I can see in the future that for uh, the supercritical CO2 market, through additive manufacturing, for example, you could find um, many more competitors emerging and therefore much lower prices. Uh, the challenges at the bottom there, I'm going to address as I, as I go through this, this talk. Um, there's a variety of applications um, from the, uh, the direct fired cycles that we've, we've just heard about to the indirect cycles as well. Um, we can use it in, in the nuclear industry, coal or gas fired, as we've heard, concentrating solar power, which is my particular background, waste heat, geothermal, I'm not so sure about. I think that the organic Rankine cycles still probably hold the um, Hold the edge there, but um, down, down to around uh, 350 degrees C, I think that um, supercritical CO2 looks pretty interesting. Dual heating of thermal energy storage, where at times you can get very low cost PV or wind electricity, and you can use that to charge um, thermal energy storage through resistance heating. But in, in order for that, that whole cycle to make sense, you've got to have a very efficient power cycle on the back end. 
And so supercritical CO2 works well there. And it can also work as a nice bottoming cycle for um, other high temperature applications such as GT um, CCs. Just quickly, there's a whole range of different um, configurations and, and complexities that you can put together with, uh, with recuperators and compressors and, uh, and expanders in a supercritical CO2 cycle. The most simple one shown there on the, the top left um, with, just, with just a recuperator. This one actually shows, shows it with reheat. Um, on the, the right-hand side, there's slightly more complexity because the, uh, the, the thermal capacitance of, of, uh, of cold CO2 is much, much uh, higher than the, than the thermal capacitance of hot CO2. And you don't want all of that energy expanding, um, sorry, being expended through the cooler. So you can, uh, you can uh, split the flow as, as shown here at point number six, just after the, the low temperature recuperator and before the cooler, put it back through another compressor and increase the overall cycle efficiency. A um, couple of other cycles there, um, again, increasing the complexity, but the one on the right, um, the, the, the recompression cycle there um, is, um, is one of the highest efficiency cycles that, that we can get when we're talking about conventional supercritical CO2 two cycles. Um, and here's some couple of curves showing that, that, that efficiency. Um, on the left-hand side with no reheat and at 700 degrees Celsius turbine inlet temperature, a simple cycle giving us around about 45% efficiency. Um, but if we go to the more complex cycles, they're getting up around uh, 52%. If we add reheat in, it, it increases the overall efficiency by around about two percentage points. Uh, because you're, you're um, increasing the average, the average temperature, which you add heat to the cycle. Now, more realistically, in countries like um, Australia and, and Saudi Arabia, which have very high ambient temperatures, we're not going to be able to operate down around the critical point of 31 degrees C all that often. And uh, we're actually going to be operating at, at much higher uh, compressor inlet temperatures. Um, on the left here, I, I show, show an efficiency curve for 55 degrees inlet temperature, quite a way away from the, the uh, uh, 31 degrees C critical temperature for, for CO2. But you see that what, what happens here that um, there is a much greater spread of, uh, of performance between those different cycles, especially those advanced cycles and uh, the advanced cycle is certainly coming into its own at these, at these higher ambient temperatures. In the middle curve here, I show that there's an optimum in the case of a uh, concentrating solar plant. Um, and, and that optimum mainly occurs because of the, um, the, uh, the solar receiver, but around about 700 degrees is a, is a very nice temperature to be operating at. Um, and I, I should point out this, this is showing the exegetic efficiency not the, not the first law efficiency. Um, again, on this um, uh, issue of higher ambient temperatures. So you want the supercritical CO2 cycles to ideally operate near the critical point in order to reduce that, that compressor work. Now with, with dry cooling, um, you've, you've got high ambient temperatures as well. And um, if you add that high ambient temperature to the air cooler, initial temperature, um, you're going to get a, a compressor inlet temperature 50 degrees C or above, which again, as I said before, well away from the critical temperature. There's a couple of solutions to operating at these high ambient temperatures. One shown on the, the top right here is to actually design your system uh, from the, from the get-go for a much higher, higher ambient temperature. It means you take a hit in performance but um, the annual average performance is going to be much greater. The other, the other option is to use inventory management where you adjust the compressor inlet pressure uh, to optimize efficiency when the, the ambient temperature, but the plus the, uh, the inlet temperature difference is above the design point compressor inlet temperature. 
There's a, there's a third way which is um, uh, emerging, uh, quite a bit of uh, interest shown in tuning these cycles so that instead of having pure supercritical CO2, you can add dopants uh, to, that super, to that CO2 to, to create a mixture. There's an, and uh, you can actually tune the, the performance of the CO2 cycle to operate um, ideally in, in various different climates. This various dopants have been um, in, investigated, C6F6, ethane, pentane, benzene have all been proposed. Um, and if you operate this, um, this properly, as you can see in this, this particular curve here, you can actually move the, the, uh, the critical temperature away from 31 degrees C up towards well over 100 degrees Celsius. And that actually then, as shown in this right hand, top right hand curve, allows you to operate as a Rankine cycle. You go through the transcritical region and you operate as a Rankine cycle rather than a Brayton cycle. And that can have some great performance improvement uh, benefits. Now, just talking about some of the, some of the, com the critical components in the supercritical CO2 cycle, um, this particular curve here shows that there is a, um, uh, a, it's, it's, a it's, it's a cycle which has 50% efficiency, 200 megawatts thermal of heat being provided to the, to the cycle and 100 megawatts net of, of turbine output. And you can see that the, um, the uh, high temperature recuperator is actually transferring about 380 megawatts of heat, the low temperature recuperator about 83 megawatts of heat so there's more than double the amount of heat being transferred through the recuperators than there is in the, in the primary heat exchanger going into the cycle. And that means that recuperators are a critical part of the performance of the cycle, but also a critical part of the, the cost of the cycle. And uh, most cost estimates put the, the, uh, the, the percentage of recuperator cost out of the, out of the complete power block was greater than greater than 30 percent. The other critical turbine components that uh, Jeremy did did mention are the the bearings and and the seals. If we're talking about small turbines around 10 megawatts, we've got 30 to 40 thousand RPM. So you've got very high uh, duty um, cycles happening here, and to to get bearings that operate at those those uh, sorts of, of speeds is, is, uh, is, is not conventional stuff. Um, oil, oil bearings have been looked at, but you've got to be careful that the oil doesn't contaminate the, the CO2. Um, gas foil bearings, magnetic bearings have been demonstrated successfully and hydrostatic bearings as well. The seals, you've got, a, uh, you've got um, maybe 25 to 30 megapascals of pressure inside the, 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 the unit and ambient pressure outside. So you've got a very high delta P and you've got to have a very good sealing arrangement to make sure that you, um, you keep that CO2 from leaking out too much. Um, typically that, that will require a, a seal gas system. Um, and that seal gas system can also pr pr protect the, the dry gas seals from the high process temperatures. There are significant material, material challenges um, Carburization, where the, uh, the carbon from the CO2 can react with the uh, various elements inside the, the, the steel and form carbides along the, car the, the, the grain boundaries and lead to embrittlement. High temperature corrosion, erosion, because of the very high speeds you've got from the very high, high density CO2. Creep and fatigue. Now, um, you just can't go and choose any old steel from out of the ASME um, code. It's actually got to be um, a steel that has been code qualified. And you can see on the right here that um, uh, beyond about 700 degrees C, how quickly that allowable stress limit drops off. And don't forget 700 degrees um, in my cases is the turbine inlet temperature. So the metal temperature is actually going to be much higher than that, that 700 degrees. So you're operating at a very um, uh, low allowable stress and a lot of work needs to go into to making sure that you, you choose that, that correct steel. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of understandings that are happening from the advanced ultra supercritical steam turbine 
um, developments around the world at the moment. Uh, corrosion um, re results, some of the work that we've done on looking at um, what happens with supercritical CO2 um, over various types of steel. In this case, uh, HR160 is the steel. So the base metal here is, is, is the HR160. At 700 degrees Celsius, uh, you've got the supercritical CO2 flowing over the, the steel and it forms a, a, um, a protective layer. At 800 degrees C, that, that chrome, chromium layer is, is still there, along with a small um, silica layer as well. At 900 degrees C, it is still there. But note that somewhere between 900 and 1,000 degrees C, um, that, that scale has broken off and that can, can cause real problems in the turbine or in the, the um, printed circuit heat exchanger recuperators. So you've got to be very careful about the, the material corrosion um, issues in these, in these high temperature steels. Um, importantly, these, these projects are being built. Um, we've, we've heard from Jeremy about a, a very advanced cycle, but at, at the lower temperatures, uh, there are projects in, um, in, in Europe, Europe Ecogen with its um, waste heat uh, projects, um, Hanwha and, uh, and Swery in the US, uh, Korea uh, developing cycles, Peregrine in the US uh, a, a testing a, a turbine at Sandia National Labs in the US at the moment, and China as well. So there's a lot of these, uh, these projects going on in the world, but I guess I, I, I do wonder whether there's, there's uh, too many small developments happening and not enough top end original equipment manufacturers developing these, these cycles at the moment. Um, one particular uh, supercritical CO2 to turbine program that you will probably be aware of is the, the STEP program in the US. It's a $122 million uh, project, um, supercritical transformational electric program. Um, and its aim is to, is to demonstrate the RCBC cycle at efficiencies of greater than, than 50%. Um, with a turbine inlet temperature of 700 degrees Celsius. It's a 10 megawatt net um, uh, uh, development, and it's meant to be a, a flexible platform that they can use for long-term component performance um, development. They presently have um, completed the, um, a lot of the external parts of the facility, and quite a number of the, in, the internal components making up the cycle have been um, uh, installed as well. There's still a couple of critical components to go. There's been a few issues with the stop valve, for example, um, and there's a couple of other components there that are still to be finalised, but they are looking for commissioning at the end of this year, the end of 2021, with um, uh, early operation at about 500 degrees C in early 2022, and, uh, and then moving on to 700 degrees C later in 2022. Now, this is my, my, my final slide, and I wanted to finish just on a note of, of uh, caution, because when I was uh, reviewing my material for this, this presentation, I noted the number of times that there were some dissenting opinions on, um, on where supercritical CO2 two can go. So I thought I should, should just um, offer the other, the other side of the coin, just, uh, just to be fair. And some studies do show still that steam turbines can offer lower le levelized cost of electricity. Um, essentially, uh, some of these studies are showing that for the case of supercritical CO2, maybe we don't always want to go for the most advanced, most complex uh, cycle with all of the, all of the, uh, the, the compressors, turbines and, um, and, compre and uh, recuperators. Um, because of the extra capital cost associated with that. And maybe sometimes there's an argument for um, going for, for light, slightly lower temperatures, slightly lower complexity systems, but um, getting a lower cost of electricity overall. Um, these studies have suggested that maybe sometimes the, um, the, uh, the SCO2 lobby have, have maybe not fully estimated the, all of the costs are associated with indirect costs. 
in a um, in a project, and uh, they've also and in these studies, uh, particularly coming out of Europe, I, I have to say, um, have typically estimated the supercritical CO two power block to be at a higher cost, maybe thirteen hundred to two thousand dollars per kilowatt, um, rather than nine hundred dollars per kilowatt, which is which is often assumed as a target price for the for the SCO two lobbies. Um, uh, nonetheless, I, I think that as, as Jeremy um, did, did say before, uh, the cost of materials, high, high uh, exotic materials, high alloy materials uh, are coming down, and that's going to lead to, um, I think, these higher temperature CO2 cycles looking more and more attractive in a variety of these, these different applications throughout the energy industry. So um, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, in the interest of time, we have uh, we'll have uh, one or two quick questions. Anyone from the audience? So there is uh, the one question on the Q and A box, Fabian. So uh, how advantageous in the techno-economic assessment? But the uh, A, the refining plant plus carbon capture storage and utilization, and ref or refining plant plus alum fat vet plant power generation close by. I guess it's a more general question to the earlier speaker as well, but I guess both talks are covering alum cycle. I guess uh, maybe maybe we could address that that question uh, during the the general question question okay. session later on. All right, I think uh, can answer as well. Yep. Do you have any comments to add though before we move on? Uh, I, I I'd like to just look at look at the question again. I I didn't quite understand okay. the the point about the refining whether they were talking about the refining industry or something else. Yeah, refining plant plus carbon cap CCS and utilization versus refining plant plus alum cycle power plant close by. That sounds like it may be a question for, for Jeremy. Maybe, okay. So I think, uh, yeah, let's move on. All right, thank you again. And we'll, we'll come back to you, of course. So uh, the, we are moving on to the second uh, uh, invited speaker, uh, Dr. Ashvin Hosangani Gadi. Uh, Dr. Hosangari is a vice president and founding member of, member of the uh, Craft Tech, which is a small business uh, specializing in the development of high fidelity CFD tools. So he's a key developer of the uh, unstructured code, the Crunch CFD. And uh, he has been working for many decades. And with his uh, achievement, he got uh, received the uh, three space achievement X award from NASA for his uh, contribution to the development of software. Today, he will talk about the computationally efficient high fidelity modeling framework for uh, oxy combustor in uh, direct fired SCO2 cycles. So, Dr. Hassangani. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, yes, very good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as the chairman just mentioned, I'd like to discuss a, a computationally efficient modeling framework for providing design support for oxy combustors and direct fired cycles. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues Andrea Zambon and Balaji Murali Dharan at Craft Tech who have been involved in the development of this uh, project. Uh, so I'd like to give a, um, a overview of the modeling framework uh, and then show examples for a 78 megawatt thermal uh, CO2 combustor designed by GTI uh, with some conclusions at the end. So um, just to, as the two spe uh, previous speakers have so eloquently described, uh, future low carbon systems um, such as oxy combustors have a large design space with complex physics at supercritical pressures. And so typically you're looking at pressures at 30 megapascals with large amounts of CO2 dilution and real fluid combustion. And there are serious issues regarding the flame stability, wall cooling, and the uniformity of exit profile 
uh, leading up to the turbine. So the potential for combustion instability and one of the issues which is not as uh, has been looked at with much detail is dynamic stability. Because similar to a rocket uh, combustor, uh, even though this is not a fully closed system, uh, you do have a potential for combustion instability where at off design conditions, you can have coupling with the compressor and the turbine with the combustor to generate instability. And this is a serious issue for risk mitigation. So what this means is there's a need for design support tools uh, with sufficiently high fidelity to permit parametric studies to look at optimizing the performance as well as mitigating uh, risk, risk mitigation for long duration pressure at these high pressures. So in particular, in my talk today, I look at some of the technical issues and simulation challenges associated with high fidelity design support. Uh, and you need to have a framework that has sufficiently high fidelity, uh, but at the same time has a lower cost to allow a parametric studies uh, looking at different variables. Uh, so you need a computationally tractable formulation for large detailed chemical kinetic models have turbulence chemistry interactions and finite rate chemistry effects, potentially model contaminant formulation, uh, formation, as well as look at wall thermal considerations. So the modeling framework has been um, in, incorporated in our uh, SCUN CFT code that has been developed within Craft Tech. Um, and one of the key issues with this uh, framework is that it's a time marching procedure using preconditioning, which allows for robustly solving for large gradients and density, as well as thermodynamic properties near the critical point, as well as phase change boundaries at subcritical conditions, just below the critical point. We also have versatile thermodynamics where we can allow for real fluid equations of straight either through analytical formulations or through table lookup, as well as a series of uh, dispersed phase uh, multi phase options. So, in terms of reducing the cost of looking at large detailed kinetics um, with a large number of species. Uh, we are looking at a three stream multi time scale framelit progress variable formulation. So, the uh, progress variable, uh, flamelit progress variable formulation allows for a tab tabulated chemistry approach where the detailed kinetics is embedded within the table lookup. And so, therefore, the cost of the chemistry calculation does not go up with the number of species since it's embedded in the table. But this baseline formulation requires significant number of upgrades, particularly one particular upgrade, which is critical, is the three stream extension to allow for cooling and dilution effects of the third stream of the CO2 diluent. We also need to look at multi time extensions uh, where you can have different physics, such as NOx or SOx formations, which are evolving over a much slower time scale compared to the primary flame. Uh, we also need to have real fluid equations of state um, and advanced kinetic models, which are embedded within the table lookup. So in terms of modeling the three stream extension, uh, what we do is essentially have a second progress variable uh, for the CO2 diluent. And the assumption there is that the CO2 diluent does not currently react as part of the primary flame. So this allows us to allow for the third stream as part of the flamelet formulation. Let me get on to the multi time scale uh, because that's a much more uh, interesting extension. Uh, so if you look, the flamelet progress variable allows for the flame structure of the primary flame, which is based on the primary uh, progress variables. However, if you look at contaminant production such as NOx, uh, they can occur uh, far away from the primary flame. So if you look at, for example, the Sandia flame D, you see that the peak turbulent fluctuations occur in the primary flame, but the peak NOx production occurs downstream of the primary flame and is sort of decoupled from the primary flame, which is at a much, slowly, a much slower time scale. So essentially what we do in this formulation here is to have an overlaid formulation 
where the NOx or the contaminant production such as SOx are modeled with a finite rate kinetic mechanism, which is overlaid on top of the primary flame. And so that what that involves is um, having multiple progress variables for the uh, kinetic mechanism describing the contaminant chemistry, as well as the primary flame table lookup for the primary flame structure. And this is all uh, you know, overlaid where we assume that the, uh, the, the, the contaminant is much more dilute and does not affect the primary flame structure. So with that sort of overview of the formulation, I'd like to get into some of the uh, applications to an oxy combustor design. Uh, so the design of, as I mentioned earlier, the design of oxy combustors for direct cycle, fired cycles are quite challenging. And we went over some of the key issues that we had to uh, consider. So from a design study uh, uh, viewpoint, the key, pa the mon a bunch of different parameters that involve optimizing the design. The, clearly the injector design for mixing and flame stability. A key issue is the split of the recycled CO2 diluent between the injectors and the cooling films. And this is a huge, uh, very important factor because depending on how much mass you put through the primary injector that alters the primary flame structure from the injector itself. And clearly, depending on how much mass you put through the cooling films, it impacts the thermal um, control of the wall temperature. We also need to target flame temperatures to control non-condensable products and look at strategies to inject diluent CO2 for film cooling and thermal control. So clearly having a, a high fidelity numerical framework that can look at parametric studies of the combustor design becomes a key aspect from a design perspective. So here we are looking at examples of a, uh, the framework being applied to a combustor that was designed by GTI, the same company that's in, involved in the STEP program uh, for a chamber pressure of 30 megapascals and for a 78 megawatt uh, energy level. Uh, so unlike some of the examples that Jeremy showed, this is a sheer coax injector design where the oxidizer and fuel are coming into coaxial streams uh, as they mix. So the, uh, the problem is, has three distinct streams, a fuel stream where we are not assuming perfect methane, but rather, rather pipeline natural gas, which has nitrogen as a contaminant. So we're looking at the composition that the Department of Energy has given for the uh, feed line um, natural gas, uh, which includes contaminants. Uh, the oxidizer stream, which is a mixture of oxygen and CO2 and the diluent stream, which is just the CO2. And for more details, uh, we can look at this publication in the Journal of Engineering Gas Turbines for more details on both the formulation and the study. So here's an example where we looked at the effect of turbulent chemistry interactions. So the top plot is for the combustive flow field where we're looking at just flame, pure flamelet, which is mixing control. And obviously here you get an attached flame with a very high temperature as you get vigorous burning uh, despite the high level of dilution. But as you go to finite rate effects with a pro, uh, within a laminar flamelet progress variable formulation, you immediately see that the dilution results in the flame lifting off. So you no longer have an attached flame and much less vigorous burning uh, in the flame structure itself. Now, when you go to a turbulent uh, flamelet progress variable, it's very interesting in that the peak while the peak temperature of the flame drops, you get significant diffusion of the flame due to turbulent effects, and you get a much broader uh, diffusion of te higher temperature, even though the peak temperature itself is lower than in the laminar case. Here is a 3D picture uh, of what the flame structures look like with the injectors. So this was the attached flamelet. This was the laminar flame with finite rate effects. And here, what we're doing is actually plotting the water mass fraction contours uh, and what the temperature is uh, where the water has been produced. And you see a much lower temperature due, due to a uh, in the uh, laminar flame lead progress variable formulation. And interestingly, when you go to the turbulent case, you see that even though the peak temperatures are lower, where the water is being produced has a much higher temperature. 
And this results uh, in thermal consideration effects. So if you look at the wall uh, CO2 film cooling on the wall, you have a film cooling stream injected right at the upstream chamber, and then a second dump of the CO2 downstream. And if you look at the film cooling stream of CO2, you see it petering out well before the second dump happens. And so there is the temperature of the wall starts to rise. Now, if you look at what the wall temperature looks like, um, you get a very interesting result that as you go from the flamelet to the laminar uh, finite rate uh, calculation, you do see the wall temperature drop before the second dump of the CO2 cooling happens. But if you look at the turbulent case, you see the temperature rising again. And this is because of the turbulent effects where the diffusion of temperature leads to, even though the peak temperature is lower, you get a much higher heat flux of the wall due to the turbulence effects. And as I mentioned, we were looking at pipeline, uh, we were looking at pipeline uh, fuel. So we were assuming uh, about 1.6% mass of nitrogen coming in in the fuel stream, in addition to other contaminants. And here the issue was to see what the, you know, test out the multi time scale formulation to look at non condensable contaminants. Uh, and so what we, and so the way we, so the formulation allows for much more detailed kinetic mechanisms to be specified for the contaminants. Here for demonstrations, we had a very simple NOx chemistry uh, kinetic mechanism that was specified as a finite rate formulation that is overlaid on top of the primary uh, flamelet progress variable for the flame structure. And for in this particular case, uh, we noticed very small levels of NOx, I mean, almost negligible level of NOx, despite uh, the nitrogen coming in the fuel stream. Uh, this is a very preliminary calculation, and there is a number of things we need to look at to make sure that, that this is, um, in fact, accurate. Uh, one is that, you know, we would probably need to go to a much more detailed kinetics model for the contaminants, and this can be extended to SOX as well, in addition to NOx. Uh, the other issue is that in this case, uh, you know, we have, the, the level of nitrogen is very low, uh, and then we also need to look at the dilution of the effects of the CO2, which may be contributing to limiting the production of NOx. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to, um, you know, we had developed a um, high fidelity within the context of an efficient computational framework. So clearly, you know, as you increase the level of fidelity for the turbulent chemistry interactions, the cost can go up dramatically. But within the level of a, an efficient framework to look at a systematic parametric studies for oxycombusted design optimization, and this is based on a flamelet progress variable formulation that has been extended to allow for uh, CO2 combustor configurations with diluent streams, as well as uh, contaminant modeling for NOx or SOx. Uh, the framework has been demonstrated in a uh, combustor, full-scale combustor designed by GTI, and we have demonstrated significant savings in computational cost while retaining adequate fidelity to provide valuable design support uh, as you change parameters in terms of the amount of oxygen uh, CO2 split, for example, or the design of the CO2 cooling injection. Uh, the prediction for lifted flames uh, due to finite rate chemistry effects, as well as the effect of turbulent chemistry interactions, both on in the flame structure and more importantly, on the thermal um, considerations, the wall temperature were also identified. Uh, and we hope to apply this capability for future support of other uh, low carbon systems. Thank you. Thank you very much for we'll being in time. So we'd like to address a few uh, specific questions before we move sure. on. Sure. Uh, anyone? And the uh, panel members, you, you may raise your hand, either physically or uh, by using the icons. Just a quick uh, modeling questions. Uh, did you encounter any uh, spatial resolution demand increase as you use the, uh, these non-ideal 
thermodynamics for uh, all these uh, supercritical uh, conditions? Um, not for the combustor itself. Um, the combustor itself is at a very high pressure far, you know, it's not, you're not operating very close to the critical point where the issue that you're talking about occurs is in the compressor. So when you, mm -hmm. and which we are also involved in, but when you look at the compressor modeling, uh, there is a serious numerical robustness issue because the inlet to the, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, if the, the design point of the uh, compressors are very close to the critical point and you can locally get uh, subcritical effects, um, particularly near the inlet of the blade. And that's where uh, the uh, real fluid effects becomes a real uh, issue in terms of robustness. But for the combustor itself, uh, it's not as much of an issue from the real fluid aspect. It's the combustion uh, dynamics and the chemistry and the, you know those issues that become a uh, numerical uh, something to consider. All right, thank you. Okay, if there are no more specific questions, we'll move on. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. So the third uh, invited talk will be given by Professor Wenting Sun, whom I know very well, the one of uh, Princeton alumni. Uh, Dr. Sun is currently an associate professor of uh, Georgia Tech in School of Eng Aerospace Engineering. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Tsinghua University and a PhD from Princeton. And uh, his current research focuses on combustion kinetics, model reduction, and plasma cystic combustion and laser diagnostics. He received uh, numerous awards, uh, including Bernard Lewis Fellowship and then uh, Distinguished Paper Awards, and also a couple of Young Investigator Awards by the Eastern States section, as well as uh, AFOSR. And today he will talk about more, some fundamental aspects of auto ignition of methane and syngas in the CO2 and argon diluents at high pressure conditions. So, Professor Sun, it's... Okay, thank you very much, Professor Yen, for the nice introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, great. So let me uh, bring up the PowerPoint. So it's my great pleasure to share you with our recent results on ordination of methane and hydrogen CO mixtures in, uh, under high pressure conditions. Um, before I start to show uh, our experimental result, I would like to share with you about a, a very simple numerical experiment we conducted in the lab. So we did a, a, a fluent simulation of a jet in cross flow reactor at 100 bar using methane as a fuel and oxygen as oxidizer and CO2 as a diluent. But we use exactly the same physical model, but we employed three different kinetic models. One is a global fractious model, and one is a reduced GRI model, and also one is a reduced uh, uh, USC2 model. As you can see from this simple uh, numerical simulation, and uh, we got us very different results in terms of temperature distribution. Ashwan just showed uh, when in their simulation, they use a different flame model, you also see different results. So that means to design a uh, proper combustor for SCO2 power cycle, and there are still lots of work to be done in the field. And this is a simple numerical uh, experiment that showed the kinetic model matters. So how about the performance of different kinetic models uh, currently available uh, in the literature? For example, when we started this project, that's back to 2018, um, we pulled up different kinetic models like a GRI, USA MAC2, high pressure, uh, uh, the high pressure Princeton uh, model, and the San Diego model, and also a Rambach model at uh, 1.3. At that time, 2.0 was not released. So we calculated the organization delays of methane oxygen CO2 mixture in terms of these pressures. As you can see, with the increase of the pressure and the prediction from different kinetic models diverge. Um, and the difference could be up to factor, uh, uh, factor three. So the question is, well, at that time, there was no experiment data at the, at the relevant condition. That means um, 200 or 300 bar. And uh, the question was simply if we do an experiment and where the environment counterfall. Maybe somewhere here, maybe somewhere here, or maybe somewhere here on the bottom. And we really don't know because there was no data. So the best way to answer this question is, okay, let's do some experiment and see how we evaluated the performance of different kinetic models. 
So under the support of the Department of Energy in the US and at Georgia Tech, we started from scratch and developed the high pressure shock tube. So the high pressure shock tube has a six inch inner diameter and overall it's about a 21 meter long. So on the corner that is a direct photograph of the high pressure shock tube. We developed a Georgia Tech and we just put everything together. So we took a picture because everything was still shiny. <laughs> uh, after a while, so probably it won't be that shiny and kind of look like messy. Um, and then uh, after some uh, initial uh, experiments to test the system and we started to uh, obtain, I, uh, I think, pretty good results. This figure shows you a typical pressure choice and also OH chemical luminescence uh, measured from the high pressure shock tube at 100 bar. So you see two pressure trees, one black line and one blue line. So the black line is the pressure trace measured by a pressure sensor at the end wall of the shock tube. Um, and the blue line is the pressure sensor measured at the side wall, which is about one centimeter away from the end wall. If you look at the blue line, you can see, well, the, the curve looks ugly because see several jumps. So the first jump is due to the incident shock. And then the second jump is from because of shock bifurcation. So the first lag past the pressure sensor. And then the second jump because the second lag of the uh, reflected shock past the pressure sensor mounted on the sidewall. And then pressure overshoots quite significantly. Then back to the pressure we targeted, which is 100 bar. Comparing these two uh, pressure sensors, you can see, well, if we use sidewall pressure trace, it may introduce a pretty significant uncertainty on the measured result. Uh, so through our experiments, we use the end wall pressure sensor, uh, all the pressure trees from the end wall uh, pressure sensor to measure the ignition delay. And uh, once we measure the uh, OH chemical luminescence, we uh, uh, find the slope and bring it down to the baseline. And then the time between uh, here and also the uh, the baseline over here and. Uh, we, this is how we define the all ignition delay. So the reason I presented here in details because how do you define ignition delay will also uh, affect the interpretation of the results or not. Um, the large, uh, uh, the boundary layer effect in uh, when you use CO2 and dilute energy in shock tube experiment is pretty significant. And also CO2 has a very large CP, so we need to use a very strong shock and to increase the temperature of the mixture. And therefore, it uh, makes the uh, growth of the boundary layer uh, even faster, and therefore uh, uh, affecting the quality of the data. And uh, luckily, the shock tube was very large, and so we have a, we could uh, uh, remedy the effect from boundary layer and have a proper interpretation of the experimental data. Uh, because of time limitation, and so I want to apologize, I won't be able to cover all the relevant data developed in recent few years, but we only focus on. Uh, the result from our shock tube. And so these will present, uh, uh, I believe, a lot of results after my presentation and from their shock tube. So first, let's look at a uh, uh, methane organization. So first, we conduct environments at around 100 bar and at 5 equal to 1 and 5 equal to 2 and measure the methane oxygen still to mixture organization delays from the high pressure shock tube. Um, and uh, we also compared our experiments with different uh, uh, predictions from different chemical models. And you, and you can see, well, after we obtained the results and uh, uh, Saudi Aramic model 2.0 was released, so we could uh, use a newer chemical model and to, uh, 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 to calculate the organization uh, delays. From these two figures, you can see the so experimental data agreed reasonably well and with uh, most uh, predictions from chemi different chemical models like uh, Aramic model, it Princeton HP model, USC MAC2, and uh, also recently re uh, released FFC uh, M model, which is the foundational fuel uh, chemistry model uh, by uh, Professor Hai Wang uh, from Stanford. Um, actually, I would say the agreement between experiments and simulation was also surprising. Um, I didn't expect that. <laughs> uh, the only outlier was the uh, GRI. You can see GRI shows a much faster ignition and comparing to other chemical models and also experimental data. So GRI is obviously an outline uh, on a high pressure conditions. And then we switch the, the diluent from carbon dioxide to argon and see whether there are any effects from the diluent because we know CO2 is not a chemical inner. Um, this experiment, uh, when using argon uh, uh, as a diluent, you can see, well, we basically got the same result. 
um, the fragment data agreed well with the uh, simulations uh, from most candidate models, except uh, a GRI. Then we increase the pressure to 200 bar to see what is the pressure effect. Uh, the figure on the left shows you um, 200 bar condition using argon as diluin. You can see basically the conclusion is similar to a 100 bar case. And the most mechanical models could predict this department, except the GRI. GRI is always faster comparing to other candidate models. And the figure on the right shows you the massing organization in CO2, uh, also at 200 bar condition. Because CO2 has a very large CP, so we could extend the department to a much lower temperature condition. And there you see something kind of interesting popping up. And uh, when the temperature is below 1200 Kelvin, um, the predictions from different catalytic models, they start to diverge. And also the experiment agreed very well with the Saudi Aramic model 2.0, and also the Princeton high, uh, HP model. Basically the experiments fall between the uh, prediction between, uh, of these two catalytic models. Still GRI is much faster. Um, so from these two figures and also the previous figures I showed, uh, we, could, uh, we could see um, pressure is the effect, but a temperature further distinguishes the performance of different mechanical models, especially at a low temperature condition. So let's see what is going on at the low temperature conditions and why GRI, if it is an outlier and why GRI is an outlier, what is the reason and causing the, uh, the, the deviation? So we conducted some detailed analysis. And first we conducted a, uh, a brute force uh, sensitivity analysis. It turns out sensitivity analysis is not that helpful. So we then turned to a chemical uh, uh, reaction pathway analysis. So you can, so this figure shows you the chemical reaction pathway analysis from three different chemical models. And you can see, well, my scene oxidation pathway is kind of simple. Uh, and the methane is oxidized majorly to methyl. And then there are two reaction pathways of methyl. One is go to CH3 and one is to uh, recombine from say 2 h 6 because it's a high pressure condition. Um, and you can see the prediction from ironic model and the F FCM model and the ratio of reaction pathways is, is about one to one, very similar. However, if you look at uh, the uh, flux ratio predicted by GRI model, so GRI predicts the significantly higher flux uh, along this uh, blue pathway, which is faster. So that's why GRI always give a much shorter artificial rate because the under predicts or over predicts and one of the reaction pathways. Um, and we also found, okay, at a 200 bar condition, for example, at 1200 Kelvin and uh, FFCM, FFCM model has some issues and uh, it predicts uh, uh, the prediction from FFCM model is different from experiments and also a Saudi Aramico 2.0. So then let's conduct a reaction pathway analysis of methane on this condition. As you can see, well, still there are two major reaction pathways of methane and uh, goes to methyl, then CH3, or then the combination to H6. But uh, Aramic model also shows there is one additional reaction pathway from methyl and it goes to CH3, O2. Um, so there is oxygen addition to methyl. And maybe we can call this low temperature chemistry of methane. I know even this, this kind of explanation is not that popular, but let's call it low temperature chemistry of methane. So Saudi Aramic model includes the low temperature chemistry of methane, but it's not included in uh, FFCM model. So that's why uh, Aramic model could agree with uh, uh, experiment and it shows uh, a faster ignition trying to FFCM. Uh, so since as this CH3O2 module is not included in FFCM, so that's why the performance is not a, not a satisfactory. So the question is, hey, if we bring back the CH3O2 module back to FFCM, could, it, it, uh, could we improve it? And the answer is, of course. So we worked with the Professor Hyvon's group and added the CH3O2 module. And of course, we also need to add a, uh, add a methanol into it. It's related with the CH3O2 into the chemical model. Then you can see the updated F FCM model, which is the, the right one, and it works uh, uh, very well and uh, basically overlap with the Princeton HP model. Uh, so that is the uh, uh, problem of some chemical models at a high temperature and low pressure, sorry, high pressure, low temperature conditions. 
So then let's move quickly to our recent result of hydrogen CO mixtures. And we basically did the same result, uh, did the same experiments, measure hydrogen CO mixtures and in CO2 value and, and different pressure conditions. And you can see from these figures, most of uh, all the models basically work very well to predict the hydrogen ignition delay, including the GRI model. So after I saw this result, I was very disappointed. So I told my students, so after struggling several years, and spend a, a million dollars, and uh, we just tell people everything works fine. <laughs> people are gonna be disappointed. And, and is there any possibility, you know, there are some hidden effect we didn't see? So we learn to dig deeper and uh, switch the uh, uh, increase the pressure. Basically, we observe the same thing, and the most mechanical models agree with the environments reasonably well. And then we switch the daddy wind from CO2 to argon and see whether the daddy wind is going to affect anything. And uh, the black lines are simulation and the, the dots are from experiments. The red dots are the experiments using CO2 as the daddy wind and the black dots are using argon as daddy wind. As you can see, well, there is some crossover from chemical models and the experiment data basically also indicated um, such a trend. But, uh, you know, the difference is within the uncertainty of our environment. We won't be able to say too much conclusively about this observation. Um, but uh, probably the conclusion is, you know, the experiment could have agree with the kinetic model prediction pretty well. And then we conducted some simulations. You know, it's kind of weird because we know CO2 is not chemically inert. It has a significant effect on HO2 from it. Um, and if this is especially important for hydrogen, but why we didn't see any difference between hydrogen and argon as daddy wind. So we conducted a simulation. So the figure on the left shows you, okay, uh, the simulation using Saudi Army model shows uh, the hydrogen concentration in the mixture are pretty different comparing the cake to the case of CO2 mixture and argon mixture. So if you use argon as a daddy wind, the uh, H concentration is much higher. Uh, this is because um, at high pressure conditions, H plus O2 plus M reaction is important. And CO2 is about seven times more efficient as a solar body collider to stabilize HO2. So H uh, radical is consumed faster and a larger amount uh, when you use the CO2 as a daily one. And then what we found through further analysis is, you know, once HO2 is formed and there are lots of HO2 build up, in CO2 mixture. Then HO, CO2 will also promote the formation of H2. And then it will also promote the decomposition of H2 to form OH. So uh, in, uh, in argon mixture, there are two comparable reaction possible. One is from HO2 to OH, and one is from HO2 to H2 to then back to OH. So these two reaction pathways are comparable to each other. And then once OH, uh, is built up, they cause automation. And if uh, in CO2 mixture, and the dominant reaction pathway actually is the HO2, H2O2, then OH reaction pathway. That reaction pathway is longer. But since CO2 is so efficient to form, uh, to facilitate the HO2 formation and also H2O2 decomposition, so it makes this reaction, longer reaction pathway is actually comparable to HO2 directly to OH. A reaction pathway. That's why, you know, in the simulation, we see different H concentrations. But if we look at an OH more fraction in terms of time, you see they are very similar. It doesn't matter in CO2 or argon. So that's why we observe similar organization delays uh, in hydrogen and uh, uh, hydrogen CO mixture. So this is a result tells us, you know, there is a chemical effect at elementary reaction levels in hydrogen CO mixture. But uh, those effects were washed out uh, because organization delay was a global parameter. So we didn't see much difference um, in different mixtures. So uh, at the conclusion, and for machine work, we didn't observe the chemical effect of from CO2. But uh, the experiments, uh, uh, after the evaluation of the performance of different chemical models and the GRI, is rejected. Lots of people told me, you know, you should not even put a GRI there because we know this, this was developed many years ago and probably not work for high pressure conditions. But still, I want to show the, uh, I want to compare the experiment between 
uh, uh, with the prediction from GRI because GRI is still a very popular technical model, especially in industry because it's compact and also has a lot of model in, uh, in it. So people still love it. Uh, but it's good to know the performance you or evaluate the performance of a GRI kind of model. And also we found at a low temperature, high pressure conditions for machine CH3O2 become to be important. It could accelerate the oxygenation of machine. Um, for uh, hydrogen CO mixtures, and uh, our experiment showed most chemical models work well, including GRI. And uh, the chemical analysis showed CO2 has a chemical effect on elementary reactions. Um, but um, the effect was washed out um, and, and bring the difference between argon and the CO2 requirement within the uncertainty of the experiment. Before I finish my talk, I want to make some clarification. And uh, my conclusion are basically based on the limited data from ordination. And so that means the conclusion only applies to ordination chemistries. But we have no idea about the flame properties at a supercritical CO2 condition because we couldn't do the experiment there. And do not extend my conclusion on ordination to flames. And also uh, CO2 and has very large CP. So physically it may cause some effect and in our experiments and we and also simulations, we have to lower the fuel concentration and all do exothermal environments to eliminate the heat capacity effect. Um, and we, I didn't mention about a real gas effect. It does not mean real gas effect is not important. The real gas effect is actually not important if the in combustor, if the inflow is hot. Hot means away from critical temperature. Um, the real gas effect is going to be very important if the temperature is close to critical point, which means in the whole cycle, real gas effect will also be, will still be important. So at the end, I want to thank you for your attention. And also, this is the area view of our combustion lab at Georgia Tech, if you've got an opportunity and you are welcome to visit us. And here is the location of our newly developed high pressure shop. And without the sacrifice and the support of my colleagues in the combustion lab, so this will not happen. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Well, so in the interest of time, one quick question from the audience. Let me read it for you. Yep. Uh, so the did you the question was from Fabian? Uh, did you update the rate constants of Aramco Mac in the form of a P log at the pressure higher than hundred bar, and mm -hmm. kept it in the um, unedited form? Also, why is a straight slope change for a CO2 dilution in case of ignition delay for Aramco? Uh huh. Uh, so first question. No, we didn't update it. Uh, so I just downloaded the mechanism from uh, Henry Kuhn's website as is, and use it as is, use the simulation. And uh, it didn't really bother us. <laughs> uh, so for machine calculation, I do not worry about it because, for example, the critical, all the key reactions, the methyl recombination is already reaching the high pressure limit. So the third body effect does not really matter. Um, and the, the second question, so are you asking this figure? why the origin delay is starting to decrease. So I guess uh, the question is related with this figure on the right. So when the temperature is lower than 1200 Kelvin, the low temperature chemistry of methane started to play a role, which is the formation of CH3O2. So we know at the low temperature condition, the low temperature chemistry could accelerate the organization. So we are observing the same thing. You won't be able to see this effect at a lower pressure because the time scale of a low temperature chemistry of methane is so long, you won't, you won't be able to see. But at a high pressure condition, when the time scale, chemical time scale start to decrease significantly, and you could see it in the experiment. And I hope this answers your question. All right, I think, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, if there's any follow-up question, we can address it at the uh, general panel discussion. Let's thank our speaker again. Right. Actually, three questions. One is um, uh, is uh, to um, uh, with the Alan Fedbitzakel to Jeremy. Uh, natural gas uh, only ninety percent or so uh, methane. Uh, how do you deal with any other residues? Uh, that is this a big issue in terms of cleaning the exhaust when you circulate it? Uh, second question is uh, to uh, perhaps um, Wes. Uh, where's best to put the concentrated solar energy? Is it um, 
is it in uh, uh, up, uh, upgrading your fuel to syngas through dry reforming, or is it sort of uh, replacing the combustion uh, uh, heat? Uh, and maybe the third question, there's an idea of uh, using argon as the working fluid and hydrogen as the energy source. Is this whatever sort of work or is it viable? Okay. I, I think the first one was to me. Uh, right now we are modeling with the, and operating with ASU being 99.5%, uh, I'm sorry, the oxygen concentration being 99.5% pure. So the, the balance is argon. And obviously in natural gas, you can have uh, CO2, you can have nitrogen, you can have you know, some other hydrocarbons also. Uh, you know, so we're taking generally pipeline quality gas here in the United States, which has a lot of those other molecules in it. And it, it really doesn't bother the cycle. Uh, when you're putting it into the pipeline for sequestration or EOR or other uses, you have to hit the pipeline specs. The, the only ones which you really potentially have to clean out would be a little bit of water and a little bit of oxygen, both for corrosion reasons. Uh, but any other constituents just increase the compression power that's needed. The more you add argon to it, you have to get a little more compression power in. Uh, if there is any nitrogen that comes in with the fuel and you make any NOx in the water separator, uh, it all gets catalyzed out to nitric acid. Uh, you're not seeing it coming through the, the water separator at all. So even if even a substantial amount of nitrogen, nitrogen contamination is not an issue. Okay, the second question was addressed to Wes. Thank, thank you, Basam. Um, the question was about um, the possibility of doing um, dry reforming of natural gas using solar energy so that you can then uh, inject the syngas into a, uh, a a, a gas turbine combined cycle or some other high efficiency cycle. Um, that's certainly one way of doing it. Um, but the problem is perhaps the, um, the level of um, CO2 that is still resident in the, in the, um, in the exhaust. Um, it would be interesting to look at providing that syngas, however, the solar syngas to the uh, alum fed vet cycle because then you get the, the high efficiency of the cycle, plus you get 25 to 30% less um, CO, CO2 um, embedded within the, the, the fuel gas. So that's, that's certainly one interesting one. Um, the other uh, interesting possibility, I think, is to use particle technology. And it was when uh, Jeremy suggested that um, he can now operate below 1,000 degrees Celsius um, if, if I'm correct, without too much of a loss of, of performance. And that brings it into the realm of the particle technology for, for CSP, where particles uh, fall through the flux of the, of the sun, are irradiated and can be heated up to, to well over 1,000 degrees Celsius. So then you could actually provide the, um, the heat directly to an advanced, um, an advanced uh, supercritical CO2 cycle. Um, and I think that that could look very interesting as well. Okay. Does it and answer the, the idea of the argon and hydrogen fuel? Hydrogen and argon. I, can it, I guess it's addressed to either of you who has uh, ample experience with these uh, actual cycles. Any comments, Wes or Jeremy? An argon cycle has been uh, examined in the past. Uh, there are other cycles also that have been, have been examined. The, it, may, it would definitely have certain uh, certain advantages. You wouldn't have to, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about separating carbon dioxide from anything. You just have to get the water out and recycle the argon. Uh, right now, argon is expensive, and you still have seal leakages that you have to deal with. All rotating machinery, you're going to have some type of seal leakage. Uh, now, those are not insurmountable issues, uh, and you know, getting there would be great. Having a, a complete, you know, carbon-free power cycle would be all, would be great. Uh, you know, we feel that, you know, as long as we're using fossil fuels, uh, making the problem, the CO2 part of the solution is the working fluid, 
uh, definitely is a a you know large step in the right direction. We think. Okay. And and well, the hydrogen I... cycle. Were, were you talking about a a closed loop hydrogen? The uh, when I think of a, a closed loop hydrogen cycle, I immediately think of the Stirling engine um, rather than a uh, uh, a uh, rotating machine. Because of the because of the seal issues, All right? But uh, you. if you're circulating uh, ninety percent uh, argon, uh, you know, I, I was listening to Jeremy saying, "Look, it's mostly CO two. Now here, it's going to be mostly argon, and then you're adding the energy through the combustion of uh, hydrogen and oxygen, which you could generate via, um, you know, uh, uh, electrolysis. So then, the only thing you need to do is remove the water. In fact, recycle it again." All right, while we're yeah. at it, uh, at the uh, supercritical, the alum cycle, there's a question by uh, Dr. Medhat about uh, what is the highest approach concentration of CO2 at the combustory inlet in testing under the alum cycle condition? Can anyone answer the correct exact number? Uh, it was around the, the 95, 96% of what was entering the combustor was CO2. Okay, All right. Well, let me, as a moderator, let me ask a, a general question to the, the other three speakers who talked about fundamental uh, modeling and experimental investigations, all very good, uh, very much detailed just to enhance the fidelity. But, you know, always, of course, you know, if you get into more detail rate constants and the uh, physics model, things will change. But from engineering point of view, we don't necessarily have to know everything in detail. Uh, in your mind, in your experience, what do you think is the most critical uh, bottleneck uh, that to be overcome, you know, to be able to capture and predict in the design of this uh, SCO2 power cycle system? Can you, can you take turn from three of you who are investigating modeling and Detail yeah, I can experiment. go ahead if you, uh, if you don't mind. And go ahead. Went to Georgia Tech. Uh, so I think uh, in the past few years, there are some quite uh, amount of uh, data on ignition from shock tube showed up. And uh, what we see from the data is the auto ignition, uh, in terms of the, uh, the agreement between experiments and the simulation, auto ignition data agrees. And we probably have a good understanding about auto ignition chemistry. And the next step is flame. And there are probably no work uh, on flame under relevant conditions. I mean, for fundamental experiments, especially my personal interest is uh, uh, because the dilute wind is CO2 and whether it affects the chemical equilibrium, for example, of CO oxidation and how long it takes for CO to be oxidized and to release the heat and whether CO will escape from the combustor and it goes to downstream. Uh, so that's one of my concerns for, for example, natural gas, uh, uh, supercritical CO2 combustion. And the other question is, I think Ashwan already uh, addressed some of it, is uh, combustion instability. You know, if we take an analogy of a hydro, uh, of rocket combustor, so um, a combustion instability is a big issue over there. And what is the combustion instability at a supercritical CO2 condition? So this is something I have no idea. Okay, Ashvin, would you like to add your part? Yeah, I, I think I um, my thoughts are very similar to what Wenting was talking about. Uh, you know, so between Wenting and uh, Subit's uh, test data for shock tubes, there is some uh, data now available for ignition times, but the flame structure. Uh, you know, I think more fundamental experiments to look at even a single injector, for example. You're, you're just suddenly muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, were you, was I muted all the way or? No, 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 no. Okay. Just uh, for a few seconds. Uh, so, uh, you know, so doing even single injector, a fundamental uh, experimental experiments with single injector would be very useful, I think, at uh, relevant pressures because that would allow us to see 
whether, you know, actually evaluate different kinetic mechanisms that Subit and Renting were talking about within the context of an actual flame structure, you know, and see what do we get? Uh, and, you know, and it's even if visualization is very difficult, getting, um, you know, heat transfer data on the wall, you know, uh, can provide significant value uh, because actually it'll give us some idea of where the flame is impinging on the wall and, uh, you know, give some idea of the mixing and the uh, dimensions of the flame spatially. The other, uh, in terms of the combustion instability aspect, I, I think that is, uh, I think that's a very important issue because if you look at the compressor in particular, and we have done some modeling for compressors, as you go off design, there is a significant uh, propensity for instabilities in the compressor, um, you know, because of, you know, what happens is as you go off design, you start seeing multi-phase effects happen within the compressor uh, because you're going subcritical in certain regions. Uh, and uh, the other issue which uh, arises is depending on, you know, if you look at the properties, thermodynamic properties of water and CO2, uh, they never, uh, there is no critical point because CO2 water doesn't mix with CO2. So irrespective of the pressure, any water that is present, uh, even when slight amounts, will condense out as droplets. Ir irrespective of the pressure. So you, you can go 300 bar or even higher and water will still condense out. And that is a very important aspect from lifetime issues, uh, not in the combustor per se, but in the rest of the turbine machinery uh, leading up to the combustor and the compressor in particular, because now you all of a sudden will have water droplets coming through uh, depending on how effective the suppression is, uh, you know, and I think that's another important aspect to think of as a system-wide uh, study. Thank but you. We're already kind of ran over a few minutes, but let me get back to uh, Subit uh, one last, you know, so you, you talked about a lot of our interesting new observation, everything's new. So curiosity is one thing, but in your mind, what do you think is the most important aspect to be investigated toward the successful industrial implementation of the system? So one thing that everybody knows about natural gas is that natural gas is very easy to deal with, right? So, um, you know, what everybody is saying is that, you know, yes, we did this experiments and um, we were not really surprised by natural gas and, you know, things that we expect were right on mark, right? So um, that's why, um, you know, the industry, uh, um, um, you know, is very confident of implementing the technology with respect to natural gas. And um, um, for syngas, uh, it's another story. I mean, uh, vending showed some result, but, you know, syngas, you can have 10% hydrogen or uh, you can have 90% hydrogen, you know, and that's called syngas, right? It's a mixture of CO and hydrogen. And from what I'm hearing from... Um, um, uh, people is that, uh, you know, the with respect to natural gas, um, yes, we did do the fundamental work and that really helped the industry. Um, and right now, you know, they feel very confident uh, of moving forward. I mean, Atrovers um, and Net Power, you know, they're, as Jeremy said, you know, there's uh, almost a close to a billion dollar projects announced in the US. Um, and so um, um, I think that. Uh, obviously, rocket combustion and uh, power generation are different. Uh, the goals are different. You know, now once you start tweaking the performance, you know, then you will start encountering issues. You know, the problem with the, our gas turbine technology right now is not that we don't know what uh, how to get electricity. You know, the problem is that we are pushing the efficiency limits to 65% uh, overall efficiency, and uh, you know, you are struggling for that uh, neck, uh, decimal place in improvement. And so uh, once you start doing that with the alum cycle, then you know there will be more fundamental work needed. And obviously um, as the industry matures, there will be work needed, you know, maybe things will go as expected or maybe there are some unexpected okay. issues. I mean, remember it took uh, uh, 60 plus years uh, for the gas turbine okay. so, to reach so where we are today. 
All right, thank you. I think uh, there was one audience waiting uh, the, uh, to ask questions. Sorry, I couldn't see you, so I didn't have a yeah. chance to give you a chance. But uh, we, yeah, we are finishing off soon, but let's uh, open the question from the floor. Hello. Uh, so my question is directed to FedVet. So in the alum cycle, with such a high level of CO2 dilution, I will assume that the CO concentration would also be significant. How is that removed before the flue gas after the water separation is recycled? Or at what level of CO, CO is acceptable to go into the combustion? And secondly, uh, how easy it is or how possible it is to apply this alum cycle on existing technologies like the combined cycle? Thank you. We, we are not seeing any CO being uh, collecting to any significant concentration in the facility. Uh, obviously, if you have a bad combustor design, then you could potentially get high concentrations of, of carbon monoxide. Uh, we are not seeing it in the facility. The, it would have to get to large concentrations before it would be a problem. Uh, and the compressors and pumps would not really mind. It would be an issue potentially on the pipeline, on the export of the of the CO2 stream for either the pipeline or sequestration or, or EOR. Um, and both of those are limited already. The, the data is out there. Uh, and in terms of applying the alum cycle to existing technologies, uh, because of the, the nature of the high pressure uh, oxy combustion, unfortunately, equipment cannot be retrofitted. So I mean, you could reuse certain parts of a, a facility. You could reuse, for instance, possibly the cooling towers, the generator, um, uh, you know, items like that. There is also a possibility for integrating uh, one of these, uh, an Allen FedVet cycle with a steam plant. Uh, we could superheat some of the steam and reuse some of the, the steam generators uh, and, you know, potentially leverage some stuff, leverage some existing equipment that way. And we have looked at that in the past. All right now we're just trying to roll out the, the first commercial versions before we start trying to integrate with everything that's out there. Okay, I think uh, we it's about time to close, uh, but uh, we, we will give you some chance to comment any, any of the uh, panelists to make any general remarks, something that is, uh, you think is important to be addressed. Anyone? How about, yeah, well, I, when we started this uh, supercritical high pressure combustor, I, everybody thought the, uh, it's gonna the suit a lot. So that can be a, one of the biggest problems. I don't see anyone mentioning soot. Is, is it not an issue at all? Or is the, what, is, what do you think? What is your experience? Uh, I can have a quick comment on the suit part. Uh, okay. We didn't do any soot study. Uh, I mean, uh, having a flame collecting soot. No, we, 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 we didn't do such environment because high pressure flame is super challenging. Uh, but what we observed is when we did the uh, shock tube experiment, especially uh, even for phi is equal to one uh, using machine, we observed the loss of soot formation inside shock. Okay. For ignition. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I'm not sure this is due to incomplete combustion because in shock tube we have incomplete combustion yes. and uh, the uh, expansion wave is going to quench the flame. Uh, this is the reason our suit is going to be a huge issue. Uh, and so what is the, yes, yeah, so I, I would like to then address it to the industrial exper you know, experts in your prototype or even industrial scale burners. Did you encounter any issues on suit? of the alum cycle? Uh, no, we had no issues with soot. Uh, and that we had a lot of discussions in developing the cycle because the soot would be an issue for obviously entering the turbine. And then it would be an issue for the, uh, the printed circuit heat exchangers we have because those are very small passages. Uh, you know, so we were concerned about that and we have not seen any issues at all with soot. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So what, uh, I have a question to you. So what is the status of uh, alum cycle in Saudi Arabia? Well, 
So is the Bassam around? Do you, well, Bassam is directly involved in some of those? Uh, I'll give it to Titano. Well, we started a small project uh, uh, last year addressing uh, a exactly what's missing based on this conversation today, a flame. As you guys know, it's very challenging to do one. We're working on two facilities. One is a constant volume uh, chamber that can reach 300 bar. We're commissioning that. That's a project uh, uh, that we developed for mostly engine application, but we're also modifying it for, uh, uh, study, for getting a flame in supercritical CO2 combined with the diagnostic that we have a cows, so we can soon, hopefully next year, uh, um, maybe I'm promising too much, but within the next two years, maybe we'll get some uh, flame data. And then the other uh, uh, facility is a little bit behind, uh, but it's we're developing a, uh, exactly what Ashwin was uh, as, asking, a single jet, very simple design, canonical flame, TNF-like, Flame for uh, uh, trying to get data, quantitative data, for uh, uh, in this uh, condition. We're targeting 100 bar to get started. Not sure if we can reach 300 bar with that. As you guys know, the experimentalists know just that the all gas supply around. It's a lot of work. It's not yeah. easy. So you guys did an amazing job. It's uh, uh, we're trying to catch up, but. Uh, uh, we'll be there. And, uh, and uh, Ong is working on yeah, the let me Let side. me add, add a note that I have been also developing the uh, simulation, CFD simulation, just like uh, what Ashvin was uh, presenting. So we are also doing high pressure thermodynamics as well as uh, flame led types of uh, models. So yeah, we're, we're also catching up. Hong, uh, I can just add about Mantist in uh, actually um, uh, looking at. Um, uh, system level, um, mostly a uh, solar, solar based system, um, uh, along the ideas um, that I discussed, uh, either upgrading the fuel and integrating it in, or um, a direct sort of um, uh, heated sort of uh, cycles using other particles, as Wes mentioned, or um, um, basically um, a receiver. Uh, uh, we want to start small, looking at the heat exchanger and so on, and eventually, you want to build it up. Uh, to a demonstration system, if we can. There's an interest from uh, Aramco, at least, uh, and obviously the solar resource in Saudi Arabia is very favorable, um, uh, and eventually, in my view, it could be also uh, some sort of uh, hybridized system where the solar is used to upgrade the fuel, and then uh, uh, basically, by integrating solar in, you reduce your uh, fuel consumption by 20%, and, and sort of overall efficiency should go up as well. So. Uh, I just got here four months ago, but I uh, definitely have plans for the future. Uh, bit by bit, I guess, uh, is uh, what we want to do. Okay. Well, so I think, uh, yeah, we can keep it going, but this is, yeah, so I already spent 13 more minutes here. I think it's about time to close. So thank you very much for all your contributions, for especially the speakers. And then uh, some of you are very late in the time now, so including myself, so really appreciate it. And I think this concludes our second session and uh, we will resume tomorrow uh, in the afternoon, Saudi time. Thank, Thank you, you all. Uh, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.